This is some more book reading from my Zen Mind Balcony. This time it's about the great pain deception. TMS gives hope. Hope is the mainstay. Hope is everything. He didn't do what others wanted him to do. He didn't do what he felt he should do. He did what fulfilled him. He became self. Which Jung felt was the goal of life. Self-realization through individuation. Laughter heals. And Bob loved making people laugh. He enjoyed his career generating laughter, a golden key to happiness, since it's impossible to experience anger and laughter simultaneously. The second thing Bob did right was to take a long walk every day. Taking a walk, widening his proxemic space. It is great meditation to go out alone and to quiet the chatter of the day. The physical health benefits of walking are as important as its meditative benefits. We are all bipeds meant to walk, walk, walk. The body, bones, muscles, heart muscle all need to be under some physical stress. The entire vascular and neurological systems need to be stimulated through healthy and fun movements. The body cries out to be used, decrease the mind's activity and increase the body's. Find balance. Proprioception defined as one's own is the ability of the mind and body to work together. A protracted period of rest has diminishing returns and ultimately becomes incongruous with healing. With proprioception, the inner workings of the mind-body aren't shaking hands as well, and the mind-body doesn't quite know where each body part should be when the body is in motion. This dormancy resulting in mind-body atrophy occurs rapidly when motion ceases. We are beings intended to be in almost constant motion, vibrating a full life, driven by purpose. Proprioceptive sensory loss creates anxiety in individuals, but it can be easily reversed. Redirecting my mind's eye From the pain to a feel-great area, I thought of this process as a cognitive transversal, but it was simply rearranging my molecules of emotion by changing awareness, perception, reasoning and judgment to another point where the mind intersects another body area. The breaking of the focus is vital because the obsessive mind attaches on tightly to suggestion. Dr. Sarno concluded that you don't necessarily need to do anything at all to heal except to deeply integrate that the pain is from unconscious rage. Train for good health and a sense of well-being. Continue the movement until the fear of pain vanishes. Building our chain of awareness beginning with forgiveness. There are two things to aim for in life. First, to get what you want and after, 
that to enjoy it only the wisest of mankind achieve the second. At early ages we are hardwired to certain realities, false images of ourselves, built upon rejection. Each self-built personality reacts to life in its own way, but if that personality's foundation is built on a demanding superego, true happiness is lost in the conflict of egos. The individual now gets trapped by her emotions, thinking she is those emotions, unable to move beyond them, unable to forgive herself, unable to push beyond her memories, unable to experience deep happiness. Memories are stored within each cell of the mind-body. The mind-body is a storehouse of memories that react to the emotions attached to those memories. In Anatomy of the Spirit, Caroline Miss writes that your biography becomes your biology. In the foreword to the book you are now reading, Dr. Sofer stated that your psychology affects physiology. And I have written, your biology follows your belief. The concepts are the same. The physical body reveals the content of the psyche at any one time in the form of pain, illness or good health. We learn self-punishment during early separation trauma. Trauma, as defined by Dr. Robert Scare, is a state of helplessness under life threat. For survival, we then utilize either the flight, withdrawal, capitulation, fight, aggressive assertion, or freeze, avoidance of pain, trauma, response. Whichever originally worked for our survival will be our method for life. If freeze is chosen, the genesis of TMS begins. The physical symptoms that result from the freeze response are the TMS symptoms discussed throughout this book. These symptoms result from a lack of discharge of the energy pent up by a fight or flight response that never took place, expressions of conflict that desire to be known and yet for personal reasons cannot. People who wear masks seek to hide their faces. It takes energy to design and to build a mask. It takes energy to sell the mask. It takes energy to put that mask on. It takes energy to make sure that mask is on every day. It takes great courage to recognize it as a mask. It takes greater courage to peel the mask away and to reveal the face beneath as love replaces fear and self rises to consciousness. Emotional pain is culturally taboo and so masks of physical pain are worn instead. This book is about revealing human misconception. Since so much suffering begins with early separation, isolation, rejection and perceived emotional abandonment. No love, no hope, no happiness can exist 
without first forgiving the self. It comes from letting go of fear and becoming yourself, who nature intended you to be. Once fear is faced, anger from conflict fades. So I started with the end of the book because I felt this is the most important thing to be taken away from this book. And I myself, I'm working on this and it isn't easy because one has been conditioned to behave in a certain way. Especially as autistic, if your childhood was traumatic, you might have experienced rejection and you have adapted. You started to behave in a certain way in order to fit in. So it is difficult to dig out the being underneath all of that because very often you have no idea who you actually are. When trauma has happened from a very early age on and you were not accepted for who you are but for who you were supposed to be. Being pressured into a mold Freud eventually gave Grodek credit for it in his book The Ego and the It. The It hypothesis, as Grodek put forth, is the sum total of an individual human being. It determines what we do and what we experience. The fact that we live, Grodek felt, was only a superficial part of its total experience. He therefore concluded that the causes of disease were unknowable, that disease as an entity did not exist except in as much as it were an expression of a man's total personality. His it experiencing itself through him, disease then Grodek proclaimed, is a form of self-expression of the entire self. Mm. Through his understanding of it, Grodek's healing methods dramatically changed. He abandoned most of his medical training and experience and turned to psychoanalysis, which he thought could help in every disease, with every physical problem. To Grodek, modern medicine was simply performing ritualistic practices. It didn't matter which one was used, because the only thing that was important was how the sufferers it perceived the prescription. Hmm. Therefore, the physician's medical Techno know how did little for the patient. Healing was determined by how it responded. The doctor 
could dress a wound, apply ointment, set a cast or amputate. But the it controlled the final outcome. Grodek felt that the physician could influence the it through psychoanalysis. From there the it could learn from its mistakes and correct them. The it is the cause that needs to be understood in healing. Grodek knew that science was working fervently on effects alone, but to him it wasn't possible to stop the effect symptoms of disease until the cause was more fully understood. Here is where Grodek and Sarno collide in success. She loves her children more than her own life, but their demands of her enrages her so intensely that she could never follow through with what she is unconsciously thinking about doing to them through her undeveloped self. She could never harm them because of her love for them, and so she overcopes and freezes emotionally. As her brain does her and her kids a favor by narrowing down a blood vessel carrying oxygen to her lower back or hands or neck. This creates a painful distraction from her unsinkable thoughts. TMS pain arrives to save the day. The unsinkable can never become sinkable, and so TMS exists as a shield between true self and idealized self, as well as between mother and child. So, Estefania internalizes the energy created through the repression of her true desires, and it manifests physically in her body a necessary diversion. The symptom indirectly tells her how she really feels inside because she is unable to recognize it directly. Therefore, TMS is an early warning alert that imminent danger may be ahead. The emotions have become so overwhelming that they threaten to erupt into consciousness. But societal values do not allow people to act out their aggression, so the mind-body goes into what I have called hyperflight or freeze. In order to survive, the sufferer over-adapts, freezes, in order to obey or be good. This safety mechanism, which allows for self-image to be maintained and for value systems to remain intact, while rage is being automatically compartmentalized, is repression. Repression is a part of the freeze response regarding the fight-flight-freeze survival mechanism. It is an invaluable tool in human survival when it's not unknowingly abused. What does TMS feel like? From those who have suffered and have healed, I've heard adjectives nouns and verbs such as hell, burning, tingling, thumping, stiffness, electrical snapping, coldness, buzzing, stabbing, pins and needles, numbness, pressure, throbbing, weakness and of course painful. When she can finally understand that TMS pain is her brain's way of saying, look over here, then she will truly understand and will begin to heal.
just as I healed. As have tens of thousands of others who also understood how the mind and body work in tandem to create chronic pain and illness, both of which serve as the shadow's messages. That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sour. Words like rage and anger and anxiety and guilt and resentment are nothing more than labels. It has been estimated that there are approximately 600 shades of motions that people can experience. Let's get a few facts straight from the get-go. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not even that politically minded. But I do like to think for myself. I'm a natural skeptic and pragmatist. These days, there are a couple of issues in my line of work that are making my blood boil. And I'm working to connect the dots between them to help establish a framework for a truth in science sniff test. For one, symptoms of mental illness are not entirely a psychological problem, nor are they purely a neurochemical issue. And, as we'll see shortly, not a single study has proven that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. Depression is merely a symptom, a sign that something is off balance or ill in the body that needs to be remedied. And two, depression is a grossly misdiagnosed and mistreated condition today. Dr. Kelly Brogan, a mind of your own. Prior to the 20th century, coercive persuasion emanated from two unlikely locations, dungeons and churches. Over the centuries, torturers discovered that the psychological aspect of torture were as persuasive as the pain itself, and church leaders learned what factors make people more receptive to religious conversion. In most instances of 20th century brainwashing, one can find echoes of torture combined with ecstatic belief. What is brainwashing, really? I think we learn that from a very early age. Emotions like rage and anxiety and happiness generate energy within the body, so there are truly only two types of emotion. It is either a good one or a bad one, with varying shades of each other. This quote is from this book, The Great Pain Deception. Faulty medical advice is making us worse. Well, of course, if you are tortured, then this is real pain. I'm not talking about that. What I want to point out is how we are programmed through society to behave in a certain way. This is very early conditioning. And in a way, it is brainwashing. Now TMS occurs within the free site or hyperflight of the fight, flight, freeze survival response mechanism. At some point earlier in the individual's life, he or she survived a perceived threat, embarrassment or even shame by not fighting. 
to express himself or herself, or was unable to escape his or her situation due to helplessness. He or she then necessarily freezes to avoid the emotional pain, hardwiring false memories that are forever stored in his or her survival brain unless properly discharged or recognized. His or her brain now has a new procedural conditioned response on how to handle future threatening scenarios because he or she feels continually helpless with the help of the medical industry and society as well. It's a programming. The problem is that it is a false conditioned response, not necessary. The individual suffering from any host of chronic symptoms has never purged an early perceived trauma from his or her memory bank. In Coming to Our Senses, Morris Berman describes something very similar. Page 20. As a family, we rarely, if ever, sat around just being with each other. That never seemed to happen. The unstated rule seemed to be that empty space was uncomfortable and that it was necessary to fill it up. Silence, not of the hostile variety, but rather of the kind that simply expresses beingness, was apparently, and I believe unconsciously, seen as threatening. It was as though something potentially dangerous would emerge. If the talking were to stop for anything longer, than half a minute or so. And what is being avoided are questions of who we are and what we are actually doing with each other. These questions live in our bodies and silence forces them to the surface. If such questions ever get openly asked, the family often falls apart and the dinner party usually breaks up in a strained and embarrassed way. With each new conflict or trauma throughout his or her life, he or she screens the new threat through his or her falls or corrupted memory and re-experiences helplessness forever stuck in his or her own past, reacting the same way each time. So I think the process of brainwashing is just a step farther down the line. Same principle. When I tell people that I've been interested in brainwashing, the typical response is, Joel, this, is, uh, this reeks of musty Cold War stuff and bad science and ethically challenged scientists. Well, that's partially true, but it is not uh, a le it's not something that is only from a hundred years ago. Brainwashing or coercive per persuasion continues to be active uh, and to develop even a century later. And yes, there were some uh, bad scientists involved, but there were also Nobel laureates involved. And some were ethically challenged. But I think the story of brainwashing 
is really the history of those individuals and the social forces they were caught up in. So I'd like to give you an overview of my book by highlighting some of the 20th century events where brainwashing has been evoked. Throughout this talk, please consider two questions. Was this event a manifestation of brainwashing? And what aspects of the event shaped your opinion? As a psychiatrist, I should be one of the last people to believe the world operates rationally. I know better. Leaders have all too often been Pied Pipers, but something new emerged in the 20th century. I still don't know what to call this phenomenon. Brainwashing, coercive persuasion, thought control, dark persuasion, all these terms refer to the fact that certain techniques render individuals shockingly vulnerable to indoctrination. I don't think brainwashing is a musty topic, although it is one with a long history. Well, in my previous book, Anatomy of Malice, I focused on understanding how state leaders could orchestrate malice on a genocidal level. Subsequently, I started wondering about how a population could be persuaded to follow such a path. Were they inherently murderous, as Daniel Goldhagen suggested? Were they hoodwinked by propaganda? Or were they brainwashed? And what did that term even mean? Where did it come from? Even despite my interest in the topic, I would probably never have written the book if it weren't for my neighbors who were members of the Heaven's Gate commune. A few miles away from us, our neighbors had themselves castrated and then committed a mass suicide so they could teleport to the stars. It's one thing when there's a suicidal cult half a world away but when it's your neighbors, it demands study. And so I began my work on dark persuasion. Now, before we go into this very far, we need to ask a question about terminology. And it's a very important topic, particularly with brainwashing. It's such a flamboyant term. What does this term mean? There are lots of other terms that refer to aspects of persuasion, indoctrination, conversion, propaganda, or even education. But in its, its essence, brainwashing involves duress or intimidation. Frequently, the victim is isolated and subjected to harm while being manipulated. The best term is coercive persuasion, but the word brainwashing vastly dominates the general usage. People have been coerced by torture for centuries, but it's not so clear that torture changes actual belief. Religious conversion, likewise, is an old process that has sometimes been coerced. But the beginning of coercive persuasion dates to the Russian Nobel laureate Ivan Pavlov, who brought scientific methods to changing behavior. For decades, the West was preoccupied that Pavlov and the Soviets had made some kind of unholy alliance to change people's beliefs and actions. As the CIA observed, Soviet psychology is concerned with the concepts of Pavlov, the belief that men can be deliberately made to develop pre-designed types of thoughts and behaviors. Some of Pavlov's observations stemmed from an unusual natural phenomenon, the flooding of the Neva River, 
Let me read a portion from the beginning of my book to describe what happened. The dogs were restless, penned in their cages in the basement of the Institute of Experimental Medicine. They were alone and weary from their daytime jobs in the professor's laboratory. But it wasn't the dark or the isolation or fatigue that got to them. It was the incessant, incessant dripping and lapping of water on the floor of their kennel. Although it started out as a fairly typical overcast day, the rain increased until the Neva River once again flooded and it headed straight for the dogs. The water level in the kennel rose and the dogs started barking. At first their paws sloshed around in the chilly water, but as the hours went by the water covered their bellies and shoulders until they were half floating in the cages with their nostrils pressed anxiously against the wire mesh in the cages. They howled in fear and desperately snuffled the air. At the last moment a dog handler raced through the flooded streets to the institute where he encountered panicked dogs and floating cages. One by one he rescued the dogs but first he had to force their heads under the water to get them out of the cages. The dogs were never the same. Their disp dispositions changed dramatically. The meek became aggressive and the gregarious became shy. It was as if an entirely new being inhabited each dog. This was bad enough, but the researchers were also struck by the fact that the dogs had forgotten all of the complex learning they had acquired in the laboratory. The dogs' memories were wiped clean. The staff talked about the dog's memory loss for weeks, and the scientists wrote their colleagues about this strange event. This might have been dismissed as a curiosity, except that it took place in the laboratory of the Nobel laureate Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov built his career on meticulous observation and experimentation. For the rest of his life, he talked about the flood and his comments about traumatic stress and memory reverberated widely given his relationship with Russia's communist leaders. This would all have led just to scientific papers except for Lenin's interests. He visited Pavlov's laboratory and asked Pavlov's help in molding the new Soviet man to build the new world of communism. Pavlov asked, do you mean you would like to standardize the population of Russia, make them all behave in the same way? Lenin said, exactly, and you will help us. The Soviets handsomely supported Pavlov, funded him with over 350 researchers for his institutes. Stalin also protected Pavlov, even during the Great Terror, when Stalin attacked so many prominent Russians, Pavlov was safe. There has always been a suspicion that Pavlov influenced how prominent party officials were interrogated and induced to make unusual confessions during the show trials. Bukharin was the principal target of the third show trial. Charged with plotting to assassinate Lenin and Stalin and give Soviet territories to Japan, Germany, and Great Britain. He abjectly confessed to it all, saying, I have no intention of recanting anything I have confessed. The monstrousness of my crimes is immeasurable. Other leading Soviets similarly confessed, saying things like, there is no country on earth filled with such happy people 
farewell, my beloved country. Observers wondered how the Soviets extracted such confessions. They used a mixture of techniques, including solitary confinement, sleep deprivation, constant interrogation, and demands for confession. They alternated brutality and kindness, all imposed methodically and patiently, like a scientific experiment. When Pavlov died in 1949, a glowing obituary in Pravda commented on his accomplishments in achieving unlimited power over the work of the brain. It is interesting that in the ensuing cases of coercive persuasion in the 20th century, Pavlov's name is invariably mentioned. When World War II broke out, the Allies and Axis countries turned away from a preoccupation with show trials and confession and focused instead on drugs for interrogation, came popular after John Snow treated Queen Victoria with chloroform. German doctors found that a combination of scopolamine and morphine was safe and effective in eliciting what they called Dammerschlaf, or twilight sleep. Hypnosis. In 1916, Ferris, Texas obstetrician Robert House performed a home delivery in a farmhouse using the twilight sleep protocol. He observed a curious phenomenon. After delivering the baby, he looked around for a kitchen scale to weigh the child. No one knew where it was. When the mother, who was still under anesthesia, piped up and said, the scales are in the kitchen on the nail behind the picture. House was intrigued. He became convinced that twilight sedation made it impossible to lie. Furthermore, he was convinced that the jails were full of people who were wrongly convicted. Sheriffs, prosecutors, and defense attorneys sought him out to interrogate prisoners to learn the truth. His technique rapidly achieved worldwide prominence. This illustration of Dr. House and a prison inmate comes from a textbook of forensic psychiatry published in Spain almost a century ago. Meanwhile, psychiatrists were experimenting with drugs to treat catatonia, fugue, or dissociative memory loss and battle fatigue. Various barbiturate compounds could get patients talking and remembering. My old professor Lindemann noted that after administering uh, barbiturates, there was a feeling of well-being and serenity, a desire to communicate, a willingness to speak about very personal problems usually not spoken of to strangers. Honor for me. I'm so excited to talk to you. I've known about you for a while, but it's cool getting you on the podcast. So awesome. thank you. I'm excited. Yes, thank you. Can we start off by you giving a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Yeah, I guess to the most relevant and interesting uh, detail about my sort of resume, so to speak, is that I have had many, many a rebirth, right? So I'm probably on like my eighth personality in this lifetime. And I was very, very much a uh, kind of died in the wool believer in what I now refer to as the church of scientism, but what was uh, previously referred to in my life as conventional medicine. And I became interested in becoming a, a allopathic doctor when I was at MIT for undergrad and I was working a suicide hotline actually called Nightline. And suicide is a completed suicide, actually. It's a big issue at MIT. probably still is. This was some time ago, obviously. But I became really inspired and convinced that we had cracked the code of human behavior and human suffering and that psychiatry and associated medications held the answer. And so we just needed to connect those who are suffering to the system that would help them. 
And I was supervised by this grandfatherly psychiatrist. And I thought, wow, I really want to do good in the world through this field. And so I went to medical school, you know, with that intent. And I specialized in a, a burgeoning field at the time called reproductive psychiatry, which is the, believe it or not, medicating with psychotropics of pregnant and breastfeeding women. I was one of the first wow. 300 in the world uh, as, as, you know, what ultimately was emerging at the time was the fact that one in four women were on psychotropic medications going into pregnancies or considering pregnancy or unexpectedly, you know, pregnant. And we didn't have the data to help them make any sort of informed uh, decision. And so there were a group of dedicated uh, psychiatrists who were really focusing mostly on what's called registry data, which is the passive collection of outcomes by the pharmaceutical companies themselves to kind of inform whether or not there are any major red flags or major signals of harm. And so I spent some time, you know, uh, trying to help women navigate whether to continue medications, start them, discontinue them. But the only so-called alternative was just not taking your meds, right? There wasn't this concept that there's anything else to do with symptoms other than, you know, psychotherapy, medication, or just kind of like white knuckle it. And so it really wasn't until I was uh, pregnant myself, postpartum, and diagnosed with my first health condition. And prior to that, I had been very kind of disembodied. <laughs> like I just wasn't in this vessel. And I've always been, I guess, kind of like naturally on the thin side. So I could eat McDonald's five to seven times a week in White Castle and Popeye's and candy all day long and never exercise and, you know, take birth control. And it just wasn't a thing. I thought I was like an irritable, tired person. And that was kind of it, you know, and when I was diagnosed with something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, I just didn't want to take a prescription for the rest of my life. It was really a matter of convenience, but I knew that there was no other way, you know, that the conventional system had to offer me. And so I went to a naturopath, which is so funny to me now because I was very disparaging as you are, you know, when you are dogmatic of, you know, so-called alternative medicine and I went to this, you know, very brilliant naturopath in New York City, and she helped me to adjust my diet, <laughs> and I took a bunch of supplements, and I saw on paper, which is what I needed, the way my mind works, I needed that proof, I still do, uh, and I saw on paper, you know, my antibody levels, you know, go from the high 2000s to normal range, and my, something called TSH, you know, normalize, and instead of feeling, you know, so excited and wow, I just, you know, put this into remission. I was enraged. Something <laughs> ignited in me that was, I'm still working on. <laughs> I'm still working on 11 years later. And I, I, it's like I took my sword out of my sheath and I was, I ran naked onto the battlefield and I spent years um, very angry. You can even, if, if you've read my first book, you can feel it. <laughs> you know, I had a, an amazing co-writer who helped polish me up a little bit, but you can feel it. I felt the betrayal, you know, that a child feels when they see that their, their parent, you know, injured them or harmed them or maybe didn't have their best interest at heart in a, in a moment. And I, I fought that very adolescent uh, fight for some years against the pharmaceutical industry as a whole. At the time, I had also read a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic and uh, by Robert Whitaker, and he's an intrepid investigative journalist. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know him. And uh, yeah. I never prescribed a medication again after I turned the last page. I, I committed. Uh, it wasn't even an effort, actually. Um, my entire practice for the ensuing, you know, 11 some years to uh, helping patients come off of medication. And so I have you know, more experienced than most the world over because I have never restarted someone on medication. I have never initiated a medication since that time. So I've come to really see what the dark night of the soul, you know, that is induced by these medication withdrawal experiences and, and even very strategically engaged tapers, uh, what it can really look like on a psychospiritual level, but also on a physiologic level, because I've said many times that I believe uh, psychotropic medications to be the most habit forming chemicals on earth. And there's something very, very powerful, as you know, um, that is engaged when you, when you take that first, that first potion 
uh, to your lips. And so, you know, since that time, I've done a lot of personal spiritual work on transforming that rage and aggression and anger and righteousness, uh, my shadow really. And I have, uh, spent probably the past three or so years, but largely since meeting my now husband, uh, Sayer, um, really trying to come into, you know, that complementary energy, that feminine energy and embody and really, uh, come into balance as, you know, a mother and, uh, someone who has, you know, heart to share as well. Yeah. So I think we should talk a little bit about turning, especially as a woman, turning that like anger and rage and also ability to be extremely competent in research, not to like toot my own horn or anything, but I mean, you're smart, obviously you went to MIT, then you figured out that medical community isn't exactly what everybody thinks it is, which is an insane discovery, right? Um, and turning that into some sort of feminine spirit or power or something. I think we should touch on that a little bit because mostly I just want to hear what you have to say for me, but I'm sure somebody <laughs> listening is also going to take some lesson away from it. Yeah, no, so how it's, did you, it's how did relevant. You that? It's relevant to all of us right now um, in this current moment. And I've come to see the sort of awareness generating experiences that we sometimes bring to ourselves. Like you, you mentioned being a researcher, right? A citizen researcher. And I've come to see these, um, you know, sort of journeys as being largely driven by our relationship to our own personal and specifically childhood trauma, because I've come at it through the intellectual informational angle. You know, when I uh, started to research all pharmaceuticals that I had ever thought were sacred cows, and that includes the birth control I was taking, that includes all of the psychotropics I was prescribing, that includes antibiotics, of course, I'd taken plenty of in my life, that includes vaccines, which I was in a position to have to decide around as a new mother. Uh, I, you know, am very adept at, for whatever reason related to my intellectual defen defenses, I'm very adept at understanding, reading, and translating scientific medical literature. And so I would collect all of these references, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them in my blogs and in my books and whatever. And I would do presentations and keynotes and all this stuff around the world. And honestly, I'm not sure I have ever changed someone's mind. That way, yeah. Ever. Not, like literally not one person ever. And I'm a decent debater too, you know? So I don't, I'm not afraid, um, you know, to run my, run my mouth. And that really stumped me because, you know, when my first book came out, which was blacklisted uh, by mainstream media, despite having gotten a very uh, generous advance and being the feature book at HarperCollins in its you know, publish, publishing season, I thought, well, anyone who reads this will never touch a medication again. Done. Case closed. You know, I've made the point. There's a better way. And obviously that did not happen, <laughs> which is why I wrote a second book largely about what it is that drives our devotional trust in a system that has never once demonstrated that it has our well-being in mind, nor that it defines health in the same way that we do, right? Most, most know that the conventional system is terrified of death, right? This is an existential issue that has been codified into an entire system that is now dominating the world orthodoxy you know, around this concept of health being just the absence of death. Uh, and that's not what we experience health as, right? We experience health as this very complex, dynamic uh, vitalism, right? Which is more a chiropractor, you know, sort of concept. They've been championing that for, for decades. So I've really come to understand this developmental, maturational arc that is the human journey, right? That requires a very important element, which is initiation to self. And in our country, I'll just speak for Americans, we have no relationship to that whatsoever, right? We don't know what it is to transition from dependency on our parents and our parents' worldview and navigating around that worldview, whether we reject it fiercely, which is what you're doing, what I've done, right? That rejection is, is still, you know, kind of circumnavigating the authority of the parent, Sovereignty doesn't look like that. 
Adultification doesn't look like that. Individuation doesn't look like that. So how do you transition from either complying or defying with your parents or a projected authority, whether that's the medical system, the doctor, or the teacher, or the principal of the school, whatever it is, your boss, how do you transition from you know, that dependent patterning of relating to authority through these vectors into self-possession, into an understanding of who you are and that your essential self doesn't need anything else in the world to change in order for you to be okay, right? How do you access that spine and still have your heart soft and open? That normally is done indigenously, traditionally, through some sort of initiation ritual that is held by you know the community at large where you're reflected that when you think you're about to die right so let's say it's a vision quest or something like that you don't you don't die and you come into contact with that deeper ground of being that will then support you as you understand who it is that you actually are independent of those influences and conditioning and programming of your family of origin. So this should happen in our teen years, right? But instead we have this extended childhood that takes us through college where we, you know, we don't have any understanding of who it is that we are. And we are constantly following orders, encouraged to be obedient and compliant, and largely confined to a very, very small box of critical thought, right? These observations on drugs and truth telling were of great importance to the military in World War II. Meanwhile, the United States set up a secret commission to study if truth drugs could be developed to speed interrogation of prisoners of war. Curiously, they focused a great deal on marijuana. The OSS worked with leading academics to study how useful such drugs were and to investigate if people could really be compelled to tell the truth. After World War II ended, the world sighed with relief, but it was a short sigh, terminated by worldwide confrontation between East and West. It wasn't just about empire, land, and trade. The Cold War was also a fervent battle about doctrine and efforts to convert the enemy. Thus, coercive persuasion entered the next chapter. The Cold War started off with another show trial, this time involving Hungarian Cardinal Joseph Mingenti. This slide shows a before and after view of the Cardinal. He was an ardent Hungarian nationalist who opposed any encroachment on the rights of the church. He was imprisoned, placed in solitary, starved so much that he lost 50%, 50% of his body weight, beaten and drugged. But what got to him most was the solitude. He wrote, the quiet of solitary destroys the nerves. The monotony shatters the nervous system and wears the soul thin. He eventually confessed to a series of unlikely deeds like trying to steal the Hungarian crown jewels. The West assumed that the confessions were elicited through some special communist breakthrough in coercive persuasion. Meanwhile, half a world away, the biggest flashpoint of the Cold War took place in Korea. It was a vicious conflict fought in extreme conditions. The United States was unprepared for the war, sent troops to Korea in the dead of winter, dressed in summer tropical uniforms, and the front lurched repeatedly north and south. In the first year of the war, many American troops were captured there were high death rates <clears throat> amongst the POWs and many collaborated with the enemy by broadcasting anti-war messages. When the armistice was finalized, all prisoners were given a choice of where they wanted to be relocated. We crowed when thousands of Chinese and North Koreans 
repudiated going home and preferred to settle in the West. We were absolutely flummoxed when about 20 American POWs refused to come home, preferring instead to settle in China or Russia. How had this happened? What kind of dark techniques did the communists employ? How could we protect our troops from such techniques? How could we pry information out of the enemy, or alternatively? Could we delete memories from our soldiers' minds that were best not recollected? Memories were indeed destroyed using these techniques, and lives were lost. Research during the Cold War proved that coercive persuasion could be a powerful tool, but it required time and patience. Then, in the 1970s, startling accounts surfaced of sudden persuasion among hostages who incomprehensibly started sympathizing with their captors. Data poured in across the world confirming such phenomena. Patricia Hearst's trial for bank robbery obsessed a nation, absorbed in whether brainwashing existed and if it could exonerate a defendant. Flash conversion of hostages, Stockholm Syndrome and its variants. It was the hostages' fault. They did everything I told them to do. Why didn't any of them attack me? There was nothing to do but get to know each other. How are hostages supposed to behave? If they are rescued, what should their feelings be toward their captors? The assumption is that rescued hostages would not only feel grateful to their rescuers, but would look forward to their assailant's punishment. However, two bank robberies revealed that hostages' feelings and behavior could be radically different from our expectations. The first case gave rise to the term Stockholm Syndrome. While some kidnappers were able to radically change their hostages' behavior, usually this did not reflect the kidnappers' deliberate intention. Rather, the changes were a byproduct of what one hostage called the constant and palpable threat of death and feeling helpless. Paradoxically, hostages wound up liking their captors and defying their rescuers. The kidnappers thus demonstrated a powerful, if inadvertent, type of dark persuasion. Clerics would show an ability to wield even more alarming influences. While the experience was terrifying to the hostages, the robbers treated them with some consideration. One young woman, Christine Enmark, commented that Olson was very kind because he let her go to the bathroom. Of leash. On the way, she saw police hiding in the corridor. They asked her how many hostages were in the vault, and she showed them by holding up her fingers. She remembers, I felt like a traitor. I didn't know why. The robbers negotiated for telephone and encouraged their hostages to call their loved ones. Brigitta, unsuccessful in reaching her husband, began to cry. Olson touched her cheek comfortingly, saying, Try again, don't give up. 
On another occasion, he consoled her by drawing her to his knees. As Brigitta reported after her release, the robber told me that everything would be all right if only the police would go away. I agreed with him then. Yes, I thought, it is the police who are keeping me from my children. At other times, Olson's behavior was more menacing. Once impatient with the delays, he grabbed Elizabeth Aldgren by the throat and threatened to kill her immediately unless the government guaranteed their getaway. Later, when Elizabeth was called and shivering in the bank vault, Olson draped his coat around her. She later recounted that he presented an unlikely combination of brutality and tenderness. The government requested that the police be allowed to examine the hostages to verify their well-being, and the robbers agreed. The police were flabbergasted at what they found. The hostages greeted them with sullen hostility, and Olson, relaxed and easygoing, had his arms around the women, as though they were friends. Hostage Christine Enmark phoned the Prime Minister and during the 45-minute conversation showed a surprising antagonism toward her would-be rescuers. What happened to them? in the prison camps. A retired OSS propaganda agent, Edward Hunter, invented a new term for this behavior, brainwashing. He wrote, in brainwashing, a fog settles over the patient's mind until he loses touch with reality. Brainwashing is something new, which is contrary to human nature and inseparable from communism. He didn't exactly invent the new word. Rather, he took a complex Chinese term, she now, and repurposed it in a lurid term, brainwashing. US military experts hated his terminology, found it flamboyant and misleading. Instead, they preferred coercive persuasion, a much more accurate term. A review of the 20th century reveals countless instances of brainwashing, vague though the term may be, in the context of isolation from outside communication, sleep deprivation, exhaustion and group confessions. People have been repeatedly persuaded to believe disinformation and to act self-destructively. A peculiarly diverse cast of characters has been involved with brainwashing's evolution in the 20th century. This recurring nightmare has played out in large cities like Washington, New York and Montreal in small towns like Ferris, Texas, and in our most prominent universities. I fear that advances in neuroscience and social media in the 21st century will create even more powerful tools of persuasion. It is folly to ignore the perils. Fascinating topic, isn't it? and definitely not outdated. So, therefore, this has become my little pet project and I plan to read some more quotes from all these different books that touch on the same subject of mind-body connection and how it can have a profound effect on our health.
It's about the cultural cage. How we are conditioned to behave. And more often than not, it's not to our entire benefit.